You know, a lot of people are becoming very interested in self-reliance and self-sufficiency and preparedness. But, you know, a lot of them are missing one thing. And if they don't have that one thing, they're going to have real problems. Let's talk about it. Hi, I'm Dr. Patrick Jones from the Homegrown Herbalist School of Botanical Medicine. And, uh, you know, there's a, a real trend among folks these days to become more self-reliant and more self-sufficient. Um, a lot of people are leaving the big cities and, and moving out to the country and uh, trying to reclaim some of the ideas and experiences and self-sufficiency that their parents and grandparents had. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Sometimes it's based on the idea and the fear, which is probably very legitimate, that the current system, the modern system of delivering goods and services really isn't sustainable in the face of a real emergency or a real catastrophe. You know, it used to be in my day when I was a kid, and certainly in my father's day, that every store in town had a big storeroom in the back where they kept stock for next week and next month, you know. Uh, now all the retailers in the country are on a next-day delivery protocol. You know, if you run out of potatoes, you pick up the phone, and tomorrow you got potatoes. If you run out of cans of beans, you pick up the phone, and you call the guys, and they bring you a can of beans. You know, if you run out of screws or wrenches or nails, you pick up the phone, and they bring you some. Nobody has any storage or backlog of, of resources on their retail establishment. And everything is uh, so compartmentalized in our construction and manufacturing industries. You know, they're building a radio, but they're getting the wire from Korea and they're getting the, you know, the speakers from Germany and they're getting the casing from Florida. And they're, I mean, they're getting parts from all over the world, and if any piece of that puzzle, if any bit of that spider web of networking to get that product manufactured breaks down, we're not getting any radios, right? And we saw that during the recent COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, we're still seeing it. You know, it used to be you could click a button on your computer and anything you wanted in the world would be in, on your front porch within a couple of days. And that's not the case anymore. You know, you order something and they laugh at you and say, well, you know, uh, that one's on back order or it'll be, we're a couple of months out on that one, you know, because of hiccups that happened due to the pandemic. You know, businesses closing, municipalities having regulations about, you know, folks going to work and doing their thing. And as a result, we're still trying to catch up, you know, uh, years later. With, with getting the flow of that system up and running again. Um, the other reason that uh, people are getting into self-reliance and, and self-sufficiency is because they're just tired of everything. You know, they're, they've learned that chasing meaningless, trivial, temporary stuff or getting higher and higher levels of popularity on social media or whatever has no bearing whatsoever on real happiness. You know, they, they're, they're relearning what our parents and our grandparents assumed everybody knew, which is that stuff doesn't matter very much. You know, God is good, work is fun, you know, effort brings rewards, that aren't just material, that relationships matter, and that, that maybe they ought to be more about deep conversations and loving service and less about emojis and likes. And uh, they're just sort of seeing that, that the modern culture is sort of a very thin, transparent, temporary, irrelevant thing, you know? And they're going back to our roots as a people and as a culture and as a species. Um, you know, I'm a veterinarian, been a veterinarian for about, oh, I don't know, over 30 years. 
I started out in practice just out of med school in southern Minnesota. Um, worked in Spring Valley and Preston and Lanesboro, these tiny little towns in in southern Minnesota. And I worked with a lot of Amish folks. And they were the sweetest, best, greatest people to work with. Just, you know, really hardworking, honest, delightful folks. And I took care of their cows and I took care of their chickens and, you know, I took care of their draft horses. Uh, and I tell you, nothing, there's no horse in the world nicer to work on than an Amish draft horse. Because <laughs> those guys work for a living and they're not silly and they're not skittish and they know how to do what they're told and behave and, you know, they're uh, really nice to work with. But anyway, I became very close to these guys and uh, I was talking to one of my Amish friends one day. I was working on his cow and I says, so, I says, so why is it you don't have electricity? I, I was just interested in the the philosophy or the idea or the, you know, maybe it was a doctrinal thing. I'm just curious, you know, and he looked at me and he says, well, I don't know the man at the electric company. I don't know the man at the electric company. Think about that. And he wasn't being a snob or snooty or like that it wasn't good to associate with somebody like that. It was that he wasn't interested in having his family and his business and his livelihood and his life be dependent on a system that he knew nothing about and had absolutely no control over. And so they did without, you know. And uh, if his, they had a, a culture of serving each other and taking care of each other. And if his barn burned down, the next morning, the whole community would be out building him a new barn. And if his neighbors burned down, he'd be over putting up a new barn for him. You know, they took care of things. They took care of each other. Um, and they operated with systems and materials and talents and work ethics and things that they could control and that they understood and could manage, right? That didn't depend on some complex spider, work, spider web of, you know, producers and dealers and shippers and manufacturers and technicians spread all over who knows where to deliver the goods and services that they needed. Right. They relied on things that they could control and understand. Another thing was that, that I loved about the Amish was that they weren't materialistic at all. You know, they had what they needed and they liked what they had. You know, that's a good cow. You know, uh, that's a good plow. That's a good whatever. I worked really hard on it. You know, looks works good, you know. But they weren't worldly in a sense that didn't matter. You know, they weren't chasing things financially that didn't matter. You know, if it, if it didn't matter, they didn't want it. And I was in a feed store one day, and uh, there's a bunch of farmers and ranchers kind of standing around shooting the bull. And one of them was an Amish guy, a friend of mine. And another one of the guys was a cattle broker. You know, his he made his living buying and selling cattle and, and shipping them all over the place and buying them here and shipping them there and filling orders. And, you know, somebody needs 100 dairy cows, okay, I'll find them 100 dairy cows. You know, put them together and ship them off. And uh, he said, yeah, you know, I, I grossed over a million bucks in the business this year, and I had to go to the bank to get a loan to pay my taxes. And all the other guys are, you know, nodding their heads, and, ah, I've been there, done that. And I, yeah, it's tough to make a living doing this. And there's a, the, the Amish guy standing there says, a million dollars, well, that's a lot of money. He says, you know, our little farm, we only made about 14,000 this year. And all the other guys sort of chuckling, you know, and he lets them chuckle for a minute, and then he says, of course, I got most of that in the bank. <laughs> right? And so he was, all of his living expenses uh, and the needs of living were being provided by his, you know, intelligence and work and preparedness and systems he had in place, you know, if they were hungry, they gathered the eggs or they ate the fruit they were growing or the grain they grew last year or they got some chickens or milked the cow, you know, the, everything they needed, they had from their own efforts. And if they made a little money on the side from the business from, you know, milking the cows and selling the extra milk or whatever, or selling the extra fruit, 
well, that's fine. We got that money and we'll put it in the bank. Maybe, maybe we'll need a new cow next year. Maybe we'll need something else, you know. But they weren't chasing stuff. You know, I never met a, an Amish man that had a storage container, a storage unit full of stuff he hadn't used for 10 years, you know. And so there's a lot of folks thinking that way. That, you know, there's homesteaders um, that are thinking that way, and there's preparedness folks that are thinking that way. I got to get self-reliant. I got to get self-sufficient. I got to quit, you know, chasing my tail for nothing and doing some stuff that's meaningful, or I have to get prepared in case the whole world comes crashing down and the mutant biker zombies come to get me. You know, I need to have some resources. I was up at a conference this past week uh, of homestead folks and salt of the earth, best people in the world, just dearly loved them. And, and, you know, they're thinking very much the way I'm thinking in my life. And, but I was very surprised that I was, that how many of them came to me after my lecture and says, you know, I never even thought about this. I never even thought about this part of it. And what was I talking about? I was talking about herbal medicine, right? I was talking about how to use plants to solve your problem. Because it's great to have a cow and milk the cow, and now I don't have to worry about milk. Got that one covered. You know, it's great to grow a garden and have vegetables. Now I got vegetables. Don't have to worry about that. Got that one covered. You know, it's great to be off the grid. I got a solar panel or I got a windmill or I got a house that I built really thinking about things so it doesn't need very much heat or very much cooling. Got that covered. I have shelter covered, you know. Well, what do you do when your cow gets mastitis, you know? What do you do when your horse gets a really bad cat? What do you do when your little kid gets chicken box or a sore throat? You know, well, you got to take care of it. And, uh, you know, my mission in life for a long time has been teaching people how to do that and how to use medicinal plants to solve all kinds of medical things. You know, I raised 15 children. We had 15 kids. Um, most of them adopted, but we had 15 kids. And I think we had in all the years that we were raising kids, like two or three doctor visits in all those years. Because we just didn't need to. You know, if we had a problem, we went out in the yard and got the weeds we needed and took care of it. And uh, and I'm not belittling in any way the medical profession. There's great people trying real hard to help folks. But a lot of what they're doing, they don't need to be doing. You know, a lot of what they're doing... Uh, could be handled very easily at home with medicinal plants. And then they could focus on the serious stuff that can't be helped with medicinal plants, you know? I mean, if you rupture your appendix, I don't have an herb for that, you know? And so uh, we have to have those guys, and they're doing great work. But for most of what happens day-to-day -day in a family, medicinal plants can solve the problem. You know, if you have an influenza virus or a coronavirus, do you know that you can take some pine needles and inhibit that virus from attaching to your cells so that you get over it faster? Did you know that you could take some black-eyed Susan or some echinacea and stimulate your immune system to fight that virus? If you had a sore tooth, did you know that you could put some cloves on it and knock that pain right out? Did you know that if you had uh, a cut that you could put yarrow on it and stop the bleeding? or that you could put gumweed on it as an antibiotic? Did you know that if you had asthma, if you took some cramp bark or some lobelia or some gumweed or half a dozen other things that are probably growing on your place, that you could turn that asthma talk off right now? These are the things we have to know. And it doesn't matter how much food you got in your basement if you're a prepper or how many chickens you got in the chicken house, in the hen house, if you're a homesteader, if you don't know how to solve health problems with herbs, you're missing a big piece of the puzzle. And honestly, it's not that hard. Using herbal medicine is a very natural, very obtainable thing. That knowledge is very obtainable. And you don't have to know 100 herbs and the 43 things that each one of them does. You don't have to know all that. If you knew 20 plants, if you really knew 20 plants, you could do almost anything that's going to come up in your family. I mean, I'm in practice. I'm a naturopath. In addition to being a veterinarian, I'm a traditional naturopath.
And so I have, for years, I had two practices, a veterinary practice and a naturopath practice. And I was doing all kinds of complicated, unusual things, right? But I could have done everything I was doing with 30 or 40 plants. I mean, I had 120 or so because I'm sentimental and I like them all. <laughs> and there's little nuances that are, oh, this one's really fun, or this one's a little better with that one. You know, there's little nuances you can do but that are fun. But if you really knew 30 or 40, you could really protect and serve your community if things got bad. And so how do you do it? Well, you just do it. You, you do it one plant at a time. You learn one plant, you read about it, and you study about it. You watch some crazy veterinarian on YouTube about it, you know, and you learn what that one plant really wants to do for you. Not a list of things it can do. I mean, so many herb schools give you a list of, you know, here's 100 herbs and a list of 10 things each that they do. But you never know how to do it. And you never know, well, why does it do that? How does it do that? How is it really interacting with the body? And and so it's just information overload, you know. But if you really understood a plant, then you can apply it to all kinds of things. And you don't have to remember a list because you understand a little bit about the body and a little bit about the plant, and pretty soon you can figure stuff out pretty easy, right? And that's our approach in the Homegrown Herbalist School of Botanical Medicine is to teach real principles of anatomy, right? What's the body doing? And we teach real principles of disease processes and what's really happening to the body and how's, why is the body responding that way to this bug or this incident? And then we teach what the plant's really doing, right? Not a list of things to apply it to and use it for, but what the plant is really doing. And then all kinds of things will open up. So if you're a person that wants to be self-reliant, if you're a person that wants to be self-sufficient, if you're a person that wants to be independent, if you're just somebody who's sick of modern pharmaceuticals for everything, or if you're somebody who's sick of spending hundreds of dollars for some fairly trivial problem that you have with with an illness or an injury and you'd lots rather fix that for five bucks worth of materials and plants come see us at the home grounder school of botanical medicine it's it can be a life-changing event you know we have students all over the world every continent uh, except antarctica i don't have anyone in antarctica but we have students all over the world that are taking this course online and they're learning the principles. They're learning what plants can do. And we're teaching them, you know, how to recognize the plants, how to employ the plants, how to use the plants, and how to get the maximum benefit from the medicines they're making so that they can solve those kinds of problems and really be self-sufficient, really be self-reliant, and really be healthy. Because I'll tell you another secret plant medicines are much more familiar to our bodies than pharmaceuticals are. And they often work, not always, sometimes pharmaceuticals are the most fabulous thing you can do, all right? But almost always, plants are as good or better, in my experience, as a veterinarian and as a naturopath. You know, in my veterinary practice, I had a couple of cupboards about this big full of meds, and I had a whole room full of herbs. And I can use either one. So what does that tell you? Well, that tells you that I can do a lot more things with herbs than I could with drugs, all right? And that I had great confidence in those plants and their actions from a scientific basis, not because of some wacky thing I read on the internet, internet, but because I understood the phytochemistry and the science, I had great confidence in those botanical medicines. And so if you'd like to learn that, if you'd like to get that piece that critical cornerstone piece of herbal medicine into your preparedness program, into your self-reliance program, into your homestead, so that you really can be independent, self-reliant, off the grid, or just happier and healthier, have a look at the Homegrown Herbalist School of Botanical Medicine. I'd love to join you on that journey. Go visit us at homegrownherbalist.com and you can learn more about it. I'm Dr. Patrick Jones. Thanks for listening.